Welcome to UNAM Chicago's Cafe Expresso, a space for bilateral conversations with people from all walks of life. Tune in to Spanish Public Radio and follow us on social media. And now your host, Alberto Fonserrata. Welcome everyone to another edition of Cafe Expresso, a space for bilateral conversations with people from all walks of life. I'm your host, Alberto Fonserrada, and today I'm very happy to introduce my guest, Silvia Puente. Hello, Silvia. Hey, Alberto, so good to see you, and thanks for the invitation to have this conversation today. Absolutely. It's wonderful to see you after so many years. Yeah. And it's, you, you really look great. How is confinement treating you? <laughs> You know, I have to confess with so many challenges in the world and so many people struggling, I just feel really blessed that we've been able to work remotely at the Latino Policy Forum, the organization I lead. We're still be able to have an impact and we're doing our best to help um, families and communities that are trying to recover uh, from this pandemic that we're in. Just so you know, Silvia Puente is the executive director of the Latino Policy Forum. This is a public policy and advocacy organization that does wonderful work. You should everybody, well, we're going to have actually your website uh, on, our, on our program so people right. can log in and check it out because you have information that's incredibly relevant to our community. And also, if you want to learn more about Silvia, uh, you can go there and you, you, you can easily spend a good 10 minutes just going through her history and, and, and the amount of awards that you have received and recognition because of all the work that you have done, which is really, really, truly amazing. Well, you know, Alberto, my mission has always been about, how, you know, my personal mission. It's always nice when your personal mission coincides with your life and work mission. Um, and in my case, they really have aligned and that I've always been an advocate for equity and justice for our Latino community. Uh, we know that there are many challenges and I am both pleased and privileged that I've been able to use my voice, but also work with an incredibly talented staff board and so many other folks who all want the best for our community and who work together in partnership and collaboration to make that happen. Absolutely. Silvia, you have been recognized as one of the top 100 most influential Hispanics in the US. I just wanted to ask you something just along the lines of from what we've seen and does the America of today reflect uh, what we are, where we are, Hispanics? When you does America today reflect where we are as a community? Well, you know, I, I think it depends on the walk of life that we're talking about, right? I mean that I think there are still many arenas where we need to have equity. Um, certainly in our politics, certainly in our government, we don't have representations proportionate to our numbers. Probably certainly not in corporate or philanthropic leadership either. Um, but I do think where we are rich in community leadership and heart and so many people from our communities who really work to try to improve our communities. And what I'll share, um, Alberto, is I'm old enough now, I, I'm a baby boomer, Right, so I am old enough now to have seen the incredible changes and in the growth of our community. You know, when I was coming up, I still remember there was a time when you were involved in Latino civic life in Chicago. Everybody knew everybody. The community was small enough that you really all could gather in one ballroom. These days, the Latino community has gotten so big with our business community, our nonprofit community, and all the other sectors that I don't know who all the key civic and business leaders are. Um, and that's a good thing, right? That are, we have so many more people in our community working to address the economy, business, our nonprofit sector, our philanthropic sector. We really have grown in size and numbers. Um, one of the little the Latino policy forum, as you mentioned, we always start with the data and how do we think about data and pursuing uh, equity. And a couple of years ago, we determined that just since 2000, well, we still have a long way to go to have equitable access to college completion. We have the lowest rates of college completion among all groups. 
But the flip side and the paradox of that, that the number of Latino college graduates has doubled in Illinois since 2000. Oh, wow. So with this young leadership emerging, I'm just so hopeful for the future and what it means for our community. Oh, wow. Yes, you touch on, on, on something very important. We're so diverse as a community because we, on the one hand, we have the, 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 the entrepreneurial aspect of these Hispanics, which contribute enormous amounts of money to, to uh, right. this country. And on the other side, and, and sadly on the, the, on the present, you can see like, for example, with this COVID-19 that hit us hard, um, especially uh, Black and, um, and Latinos have been the most affected and, and women have been, I was, I was checking out the Pew Hispanic Center, one of the early studies, and it talked about really, really uh, dramatic numbers on, on, on unemployment for women, for example. Yeah, no, and to your point, we know that about 70% of Latinos are essential workers. So we have this, again, this duality, this paradox where either we are unemployed because we're overrepresented in the hospitality and the service industry and those jobs, many of those jobs have gone away and will not come back. Um, and then we have 70% of our community being essential workers, which means that they are risking exposure day after day to day to this disease. And to your point, while COVID is disproportionately impacting Black and Latino communities, I think it's important to note that the rate of COVID in the Latino community is still double what it is in the Black and the white community. And regrettably, and this one causes me to sleep at night, when we think about age-adjusted mortality, the number of people that are dying, the people who are dying in our community are Latinos of working age and we have the highest rates of mortality, which means the highest rates of people dying that shouldn't be dying because they're of working age. Absolutely. So again, this paradox that only 16% of all Latinos overall have the ability to work from home. And so, so many are essential workers. And to your point, I think of it as it's an economic tsunami, a health tsunami and a, an educational tsunami in terms of what it means for a community and even when someday, hopefully soon, everyone gets vaccinated, we're gonna to continue to see the long-term impacts of COVID from the, the long haulers in terms of their health education, from our children who are gonna have a steep climb to recover from not having been in schools for a year and certainly within our, for our economy as well. I mean, just think about it. Uh, we all know, and we've heard for a long time that 26th Street is the second highest tax revenue commercial strip uh, in, in the city of Chicago, what's gonna happen when 25, 30%, up to half of those businesses, well, they've all lost revenue and up to a third to half don't reopen. And we're gonna see that scenario replicated all over the region because we know that everywhere we have a Latino vibrant Latino community in Elgin, Aurora, Waukegan, we have vibrant small business entrepreneurial commercial strips. How are they gonna recover? The recovery is gonna take years and years to come. It is incredibly dramatic. Uh, for those of you who just logged in, I'm, uh, I'm having a Cafe Expresso with uh, Silvia Puente, who's the executive director of the Latino Policy Forum. Um, Sylvia, if I recall, I think we met when you were in Notre Dame and you were doing, a, what was that called, the Latino Policy Institute or? Uh, yeah, the Institute for Latino Studies. The Institute for Latino Studies. You, do you still, um, are you still involved with uh, Notre Dame um, in some way? They, they've shifted, they've downsized. When I was at Notre Dame, they had an office in Chicago that I led and we got to do uh, analysis uh, the first ever study on suburban Latinos, and now we know the majority of our Latino community uh, in Illinois lives outside of Chicago. Um, but yeah, they have they don't have their Chicago office anymore. But if I could, Albert, I wanted to come back. I don't Absolutely. want to Please, I don't want to paint a total picture of doom and gloom um, because there is around COVID. There is an incredible coalition called Illinois Unidos. Please go to IllinoisUnidos.com. You can see it on the website. 
that is doing amazing work to try to combat the COVID crisis and talking to our public officials, Chicago mayor, our state lawmakers, and trying to get additional resources and remedies for what's happening around COVID. And there is definitely increased attention uh, as while well, Latino Policy Forum is doing a lot of work to help the coalition, the coalition itself is doing amazing work. And as one example, we're now having regular meetings with the mayor's office in terms of their strategy for impacting COVID in the Latino community. We have a, a variety of legislative initiatives that we're gonna work with in Springfield to try to make sure more resources come in to help people who are at risk of losing their home are not able to pay their rent and being able to provide more resources for basic needs like utility bills, food. And uh, our goal is to make sure those resources are uh, appropriated from our state government uh, so that we will see more investment in the Latino community. Absolutely. And that's, that's just a part of the amazing work that you do. I know, I know you're a very uh, humble woman, but I, I know that you were recently awarded uh, Otley uh, by the consulate uh, general of Mexico um, late last year, uh, which was wonderful to see. I, I, I was there at the ceremony. And, yes. and for those of you who don't know that the Otley recognizes individuals who aid, empowered, or positively affected the lives of Mexican nationals in the United States. So it must have been a really moving experience. I think you got a little choked up. I did, you know, people that know me know I'm a crier, right? And, you know, part of it, you know, it's like, ah, oh, if I'm feeling it, I'm feeling it. It was a very humbling recognition to obviously receive the highest honor that the Mexican government bestows on people of Mexican origin no longer, not living in, in Mexico. Um, and so to be recognized for a lifetime of work was indeed an honor. But as I said, you don't do this work alone. I have an incredible team of staff that I get to work with at the Latino Policy Forum and just amazing stakeholders and colleagues. What was interesting about that, so to me, Alberto, was obviously the recognition was, you know, I am humbled and feel honored to have received it. But, you know, these are given out to um, people living all over the world. And there was another little recognition of all of the recipients of the. So I, I received it here in Chicago, but I get to meet so some of the other award recipients um, from other parts of the world. And it was interesting to me to note that I was the only person not born in Mexico who received the Otli. Wow. Everyone wow. else, but it was also fascinating to see the Mexican diaspora. There were people that received it from Saudi Arabia and from Germany and from Canada and all, you know, just different parts of the world right. where it's like, Mexicans in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> that one was very surprising to me, but they they were all born had all been born in Mexico, right? And you know a little bit of my story. I always say when people ask me what part of Mexico does your family come from, I say Texas. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> because uh, my family is part of that. Mm -hmm. You know where we didn't cross the border. I mean, parts right. of my family we didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. And Mexicans know well the history of the War of 1848, <laughs> that most people who were born on this side of the, the border have no clue about in terms of what that meant for Mexico and uh, what it meant for what is and what currently is Mexico and what is not. Absolutely, but you are a native Chicagoan, right? You were born here in Chicago, right? I am, I'm a native Chicago and I was born and raised. So my parents migrated from uh, Texas uh, to Chicago uh, when they were both in high school. Uh, again, you know, part of my humility comes from my parents' families work the earth. They were farm workers um, and each of them came here doing that work with their families and their siblings. And in the 1950s realized you can make a lot more money if you took a factory job in Chicago uh, than picking strawberries and picking cotton and picking blueberries. It is an incredible story. It is incredible. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, 
I know you have a special love for this city. So do I, and you know it. And uh, I, we, I'm sure like me, we miss the summers and, and summer dance and, and all these concerts oh, yeah. where we would, uh, uh, you know, Millennium Park and all those things. Um, what does uh, a day look like in the life of Silvia Puente these days? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, you know, um, I've always been a bit of a workaholic and being in quarantine just makes that more intense because there's no break, right? You go from one Zoom meeting to another. And as I mentioned, trying to run a nonprofit organization, raise the revenue, but have the impact we have in COVID, in housing and immigration is a lot. So most days I'm at my computer from nine to seven, eight or nine. Um, I'm trying to shift that because, uh, you know, one of the things that COVID has lifted for all of us is that we have to take care of our mental health and we have to make sure that uh, we're doing things for self-care. So I'm uh, also trying to be very intentional about that as well. I'm getting out every morning and doing two to three miles on my treadmill. I'm uh, for fun doing Zumba classes because... Okay. <laughs> I can be a very serious person, as most know, but I do love to dance, and that hasn't gone away. Um, and then, you know, I've never been much of a cook, um, but, you know, I'm learning to appreciate cooking because obviously we can't go out to eat as much. As is, there any, is there any Mexican food that you like, a particular uh, kind of dish that you like? I'm or? still learning how to cook everything. Okay. <laughs> To be frank, I'm still learning how to cook everything, right? I can make my chilequiles. Oh, good. So, no. But I'm still working on uh, how to do the enchiladas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's wonderful. I know that we're approaching the end of, uh, of our program. Uh, Silvia, what, uh, just to sum it up, uh, we're, facing, we're, we're facing difficult times. Everybody as a community, we're facing challenging times. What do you think are the most pressing issues uh, that we're going to be dealing with uh, in the upcoming years? Just to sum it up. Well, you know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very frank, and someone said this to me, and I think that uh, there's a little bit hope of hope with our new federal government um, and our new federal leadership in terms of what it means for the Latino community and the fact that... Um, President Biden on his first day issued several executive orders uh, and introduced immigration legislation. Um, and many of those executive orders were reversing uh, what the past president had, had done. So I'm gonna use these words. It's like we're coming out of an emotionally abusive relationship uh, with our federal government and the fear and the challenges and how that's impacted, I think so many of us, even me, I don't have anything to worry about, but every time I heard the past president, it, it literally made me a little crazy. And so I can't imagine how that feels for people who are really vulnerable and really struggling and really uncertain about their immigration status in this country. Now, Having said that, I'm very hopeful for what I think uh, is going to happen at the federal level with the new administration. And there is access and there is an invitation and they are asking, you know, how and what do we do we need to do to repair so much of the damage that's been done. Um, I'm very thankful and hopeful. You know, we work on the Tino Policy Forum works on public policy issues. Um, I'm really thankful that we work in a true, true blue state and have our state, our governor and our, our elected leadership, because when we were negotiating with the state on the mortgage relief and how we were going to disperse money for those that needed help paying their mortgages and their rents, we went to them and they came to us and said, help us design this so that everybody has access regardless of their immigration status. And that is of course welcome news that we didn't have to argue that, we didn't have to debate that. The intention was there from the beginning. I don't know that we got it totally right the first time, but we're definitely gonna improve on that for the second round of resources that'll become available um, in this General Assembly. And in our State Department of Human Services, it's phenomenal uh, Alberto, and this is one of the things that we track of, 
we went from about 10, 10 to 50, no, no, let me qualify that. We probably went from about 10 to $20 million in resources being targeted to immigrants to over 70 million. We saw a dramatic increase in the amount of resources that our Department of Human Services was implementing. And a lot of that went in cash assistance to families who were in need. Um, a lot of that went to expand the welcoming, uh, the wel welcoming centers, the, the organizations around the state that immigrants can go to to get help. So we're very hopeful that those resources will be renewed and the Latino Policy Forum is gonna monitor, testify, impact, talk to everyone and do everything we can to make sure that those resources are renewed in this, in this new state budget. So while there are challenges that I spoke of, you know, I am incredibly hopeful that, you know, we're seeing responsiveness at the federal level, at our state level, at our city of Chicago level, um, and even from our philanthropic community, Alberto, because some of your listeners might not know, but from foundations and philanthropy, over $65 million was raised. Wow. And again, no question that any of those resources could go to anyone in need, regardless of their immigration status. That's incredible. And we that help to monitor amazing. that. Now, is it enough? No, because never is. it never is, right? The demand is so great, it's never enough. And that's my deep concern that the people who have been displaced from the workforce, and we know that you know our entrepreneurs, our business, and Latinas, I mean, there's been mm -hmm. reports that black and brown women have the highest rates of unemployment because of COVID, but Latinas really have the highest rates of displacement from the labor force. So we mm -hmm. really are gonna have to think through what do we do to retrain, retool, provide more skills so that those women can continue to provide for their families and their loved ones. Incredible, incredible. The task is enormous and uh, the challenge is great. Silvia Puente, Executive Director of the Latino Policy Forum, my friend, it's always good to see you. Well, Thank no, you for yes. accepting my invitation to, to, for this program. And you know, I'm sure we will see each other again soon, somewhere in one park in Chicago or somewhere. But uh, I truly appreciate your work. Keep doing what you're doing. And we will see you again. And to everybody, to our listeners, to everybody that logged in, this is another uh, edition of a Cafe Expresso, a space for bilateral conversations with people from all walks of life. Un abrazo, Alberto. I hope to see you in person sometime soon. Cuídate. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.